Yeah, well, good evening, Thomas. everyone. Um, I'd like to call the meeting of the Ducktown Council, uh, January 5th, 6 p.m. regular meeting to order. Do I get to hit this? Yeah, thanks, I thought so. <laughs> uh, our uh, Mayor, Don Kingston, is, has an excused absence this evening, and so I will be leading the meeting. And the first order of business is the pledge, and I'd like to ask um, Council Member Rob Mooney to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, and we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, next order of business is swearing in of uh, Council Member Rob Mooney, who was unable to uh, join us last month. And so, uh, Lori and Rob, thank you. I, Robert Mooney, do hereby solemnly swear that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and Constitution and laws of the state of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties imposed upon me by law as council member for the town of Duck, North Carolina. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> Congratulations, Rob. <laughs> yep, and welcome. Welcome back to the council. <laughs> Great. Our next order of business is public comments. Um, if anyone would like to speak uh, at the public comment period, uh, just please limit your comments to three minutes and uh, welcome anybody to speak. Thank you. Hey, okay, uh, I'm Wes, uh, if you don't know me. Anyway, Red Sky, NC Coast, and uh, president of the Restaurant Association. I'm here to address the, I know that it's the tents and all of that stuff, and just want to thank the town for all they've done so far to help us through this pandemic stuff, being in the hospitality business, and hope that you guys can go ahead and agree to continue the help that you've been giving us at least through this year. And because needless to say, this COVID thing is just a gift that keeps on giving and you never know what's coming around the corner, but we're here for the long haul and we appreciate y'all's help so far. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to speak at public comment period? Okay, seeing none. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Come up to the podium and state your name and welcome. I said, and welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Carol Clapper. I live up on Norbanks. Um, has anyone addressed the council about the problem of rats in the community? Uh, no, I'm not that I'm aware of, but please, well, we, don't, we can't really respond at public comment, but please um, just say All what right, you'd well, like. We do and have a problem. I mean, it's, then it's getting worse. People are calling pest control, and but the problem is people aren't living here year round and they're not aware of it. And we can do so much that are here a lot, but there is a serious problem. And um, we talked to neighbors, several, we're up on Norbanks, we talked to people blocks away and they have rats. I mean, we see them. So there's, you know, someone should look into it. And then I guess also we have the midges. I don't know whether there's anything we can do about that or not, but that would be something to consider as well. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, we um, appreciate your comments and uh, they're noted in, in the uh, minutes, thank you. Yes. Charlotte Gilmore, I live in um, Osprey community. We're 
and also about the rat problems. Um, I've been, I've owned my house almost 25 years here, and the last uh, four years, the rats, the last year, the rats have really been bad. Uh, this summer, I'm sitting on my deck, and one comes running right up to me. Now that almost did me in. So then I chased him down the walkway and whatever, but it's starting to be a real problem. I don't even put my garbage out until the day it's due because I don't want any smells, I don't want ever. And all, you know, I live in a community, most of us do, that are rental communities. I mean, that's what we are here. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sick and tired of the garbage cans overflowing all the time, I, all the time. And I think that contributes some to the rats. Uh, I really don't know what to do about the rats. I put boxes out. I, I, I also have out of banks pest control. And uh, they're still there. Now, I've read online that uh, Chicago, no, Detroit, when they had a lot of rats in their park, their, their community park, what they do is they found the big holes. I don't know whether we have that. And they put dry gas down. That does kill the, the nest that's there. But I, I don't know. I back up to the core property. So there could be a lot coming up from the core property, too. And when I, now that I think about the core property, I also f have the problem with, with, and I don't know we can do anything about it, is the, um, the coyotes. Mm -hmm. They are really bad. I hear them cry every morning. Uh, they have dug underneath the fence that exists there. They come through the garages in our community. Uh, I've seen the babies next door in the neighbor's garage. People don't know about it. Now, normally I'm not afraid of animals. I mean, I've, I'm an outdoor person, I'm in the garden. But when I'm out in the backyard, I now have got to turn around to see what's going on around me. I never had that feeling before. And when I go over to Carol's house who lives across the street, I'm concerned at night whether they're out on the street. Uh, I mean, I know they're endangered, but it's, I don't know what we can do about it, but we have that, these two problems that are not make it happy for me. <laughs> and, and, and also, I think, uh, when our guests come, too, when they see stuff, they're quite scared. All right, that's it. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. Pre appreciate it. Appreciate your comments. OK, um, anybody else for public comment this evening? Thank you so much for your comments. And uh, so we'll move on to item number four, the consent, consent agenda, which includes the minutes from the November 3rd, November 17th, and December 1st me meetings, as well as resolution 22-01, a resolution of the town council authorizing a micro-purchasing threshold for procurement using federal funds. So those are the items on our consent agenda. I make a motion to accept the agenda. Motion to accept the agenda. All those I'm in favor? Sorry, the minutes. Um, the cassette, thank you. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item number five old business um, items deferred from previous meetings. This would be a discussion consideration of extending temporary accommodations for regulations during a declared emergency. Uh, so, yeah, so Joe, we, Joe will help us through this one. Thank you. Right, well, thank you, Vice Chair Thibodeau, members of the council, uh, members of the public here in attendance this evening. Uh, since it's a topic we first addressed, or not first, but lately addressed just a few months ago, um, I won't get into great detail, but did want to um, cover this for those who are in attendance tonight who may not have heard that earlier discussion. So back in October, the council considered an extension of the temporary accommodations for businesses that were adopted um, really originally about a year and a half ago. And when I say that, that term, the accommodations, what we're referring to there are things like allowing businesses to use tents, do outdoor dining, outdoor display of products, as well as some directional signage. Those are all elements of what the council decided to allow to help businesses through at that time. And if you'll recall at that initially, the state was under some orders from the governor that really limited, in a lot of cases, the capacity of businesses to operate 
within their walls. So it was very important for us to look at our businesses and adopt something to allow them to continue to operate in some significant capacity. All that being said, back in October, the council decided to adopt a, a minor extension through January the 16th of this year in order to basically just buy a little bit of time to find out more about some of the concerns, how businesses have been using these provisions over the past year and a half um, to help you make a more educated decision as you consider a longer extension this evening. Um, we have distributed to you copies of a survey that went out to local businesses. Um, obviously, you also had the comment from Mr. Stepp this evening. I was glad um, he was able to join us because he was one of the ones who had you know, made some specific requests earlier. Um, and I'd just like to, to summarize those just real quickly, just give you a um, little summary and then let the council discuss whether or not you would like to um, approve an extension. And if so, um, if, you're, if you're looking at extending this, the length of that. And what you would be doing in this would be recommending to the mayor. The mayor is actually the individual who authorizes the town manager to adopt or to um, put forth a temporary extension. Okay, so you're not, you're not voting tonight, but the mayor certainly wanted to seek your advice in, in considering an extension, and that's why we're here this evening. So we had a f several questions on the survey, um, first of which, um, what are the types of things that you've, you're, you and your business have used? And the four things I just mentioned previously were all used by different respondents, the display, dining, tents, and directional signage. Second question was how have those temporary accommodations affected your business operations? And some of the responses including an ability to better accommodate customers, creating a safe space for customers, and even noting increased revenues as a result of that. Um, skipping over to the fourth question, the third one isn't as relevant to our discussion this evening, but describe any issues you're currently facing, maintaining staff, creating a safe space for customers were some of the key ones that were mentioned. Fifth question asked, if extended, how long should additional extension last? In that, the responses, we had eight responses that are recommending 12 months, so through the end of 2022. And we had three responses that recommended five months, which would basically take us through the end of May, and that would end just prior to the, the high tourist season, if that was the case. And finally, um, a question relating to the reasons for their responses to that question about the length. And there were a number of things highlighted here. Um, one, that COVID is still around. This is not something that has gone away at this point. And so there's a great deal of uncertainty in 2022 about what those impacts are going to be if the governor or local governments are going to, you know, take additional measures. Um, and this is a way of helping deal with that uncertainty. Because um, it would, um, having something adopted for that period would allow local businesses to plan better if they know what the rules are, what they can and can't do. Um, they also continue, they think it would continue to make customers feel more comfortable with their experience shopping and dining in Duck. And also noted that the outdoor activities um, have increased vitality through the town as well. So those are some of the highlights from the survey. Um, you have the full results um, in front of you. And that concludes my presentation, but be glad to answer any questions the council members might have as you um, just develop your thoughts and recommendation for the mayor. Thank you, Joe. Any questions? 
I, I had a question, Joe. I was surprised when I looked at the survey that the restaurants weren't on it. Did they not respond or were they not asked? They did not respond. This went out to, we have 127 businesses. This, this went out to every single business and every single shopping center owner, so that not only the businesses themselves, but the owners of the properties as well. So all, all, of, all of them received it. I, I can't explain. Yeah. Well, I think maybe yeah. the holiday yeah. season, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm not sure. And we talked about that, that there would be an element of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, you know, that's part of it. Um, one of the other things that just came to my mind is the possibility that, you know, the restaurants are working long, hard hours for most of the year, and this is the one time of the year that many of them are able to close. You know, most of our restaurants in Duck are closed. They take that break. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it's an extended break, and maybe, you know, just didn't have the opportunity to provide that input at this time. I have no problem with uh, extending it, but if we're going to extend it, I want to see a follow-up to make sure that they're staying within the guidelines that we gave them. And I see some, I'm quite sure that some of them exceed their seating capacities, and, but do we have anyone that goes out and checks these seating capacities? Okay. Okay. And I had the same thing that Tony had. It wasn't a restaurant that responded to this. <clears throat> well, I do think we saw, not to disagree, but we did see a few, we did see the waterfront shops, which, you know, does include the Blue Point, but you're right, they were just more of the shopping center, right. shopping center owners. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the fact that, um, but so what I'm hearing from you, Sandy, is that uh, you, the extension with some kind of uh, revisiting of it um, down down the road, is that what you're saying? No, I'm talking about the town going out and checking the seating, how they're doing it. Do hey, you think there's been a problem with that? I think so. That's my opinion. Okay, um, Joe, I think that um, I don't know what we can do about people's apathetic approach to things, but I think that the town needs to make a better effort to connect with people, especially this particular issue here. We know, everybody knows that the restaurants, they're the most, they're gonna get the biggest benefit out of this whole thing. And so I don't think that it's unreasonable um, for us to figure out a way, if you don't get a response from somebody, call them on the phone, go knock on their door and talk to them. We gotta figure out a, a way of getting more input from these people. That being said, um, I guess that's you and Christian maybe can work on that and, and figure out some method um, to get better response from people. As I said, you can't cure apathy because it's a, it seems to be a national affliction at this stage of the game, but we, can, we have to do better than getting eight responses out of 127 uh, mailings that went out. Additionally, um, I'm all for extending it 12 months, absolutely. In fact, I think that um, maybe you guys can do some kind of a, a little inquiry or investigation or whatever magic that you do and figure out a way to make this permanent. Because it's, you know, we have, we have uh, people that come here, right, on vacation. That's the, that's, the, that's the purpose of their visit in this town. And now it's gonna be two years that they're used to seeing this, this stuff outside. And when it, if it goes away, they're going to be disappointed because people, everybody loves to sit outside and, and eat when they're when they're here. So I think that that's something that maybe you guys should look at and, and try to figure out a way that we can do this without uh, causing too much hoopla. Uh, I, well, I know that's a health department restriction too, to the capacity of a restaurant, um, and I'm sure Joe would could speak to that. In terms of follow-up, I think too, maybe even just a reminder on a survey would be helpful as opposed to just a one-time, maybe just a follow-up or a couple of follow-ups because yeah, but this particular time of year, it was disappointing to just see 14. Although a few of them did kind of probably respond on behalf of the entire shopping center, but you're right. Um, I put myself in that included. I was sent the survey and I was kind of otherwise occupied and, and missed the deadline. So I didn't weigh in. But again, being a business that doesn't have to do with particularly the, you know, the outdoor dining, um, 
The thing I liked about the survey was that, that we did see from a variety of businesses, um, you know, albeit 14 was a small response, and uh, they did, everybody did seem in favor of extending it, and so, and I completely agree with you that um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense to only st extend for five months and, and cut it right at the beginning of the summer. There's no planning involved in that. I mean, that would just, that would basically be like not extending it. So I'm in favor of, a, of the um, 12 month and um, don't really know, you know, in terms of, of the recommendation about enforcement. Um, I just honestly haven't heard a lot of problems with it, but, um, but I do think that if we, that we should revisit it again. Um, I don't know if, I, I, I don't know how much of a problem it's been for folks, but I, don't, I do agree with you, Rob, that, um, that, that people are getting used to the idea of being able to be outdoors. And uh, there is, you know, probably, um, you know, some accommodation that could be made. I mean, it's definitely a, an outdoor area. People like, people feel more comfortable eating outdoors. It's a lovely experience to eat outdoors. And, and, uh, and, and people, we know people have really enjoyed coming. So I'm, in terms of where we are tonight, I would definitely like to recommend myself too that, so I would endorse the idea of uh, in extending this. Um, uh, the temporary accommodations um, draft that you put together is the one that extends it through October 15th, 2022. Is that the And one? The, the date that I'm hearing would be December 31st, mm -hmm. 2022. Right, this is that. just the draft that we have in front of us. But this would be what we would adopt as a recommendation to the mayor. Um, so Again, ad additionally, Joe, as I said before, you guys need to, we got to figure out a better way of communicating with people. Um, I'm sorry, Rob, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, we have, we, we have to figure out a better way of communicating with people, with the people in the town. Because I understand people look at emails and they go, oh, yeah, I'm not reading that, and they get rid of it. But if, if we know that this is something that is really important, we have to make an extra effort to get feedback from people. I mean, we, we did that traffic thing. Uh, we did it when we had to do it, but my opinion was that, that if we had done it two weeks before, we, we would have had a, a much bigger response as far as numbers and data was concerned. But it is what it is, and, and we're going we're gonna to figure it out. And I think that we can figure out a better way to communicate with the people in town about uh, the, these, these kinds of issues. And maybe that's something we can put on the, um, on the planning for, you know, for, for as well. well yeah, we that's, what I, that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. when, we're, when we're talking about goals for short and long-term goals. I, I would be in favor of the extension as well for the, for the full year. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything that's disruptive, you know. I mean, I haven't been every single square foot of the town, but I mean, the places I visited, I don't see anything that's disruptive or unsightly, you know. I mean, I think we just need to keep an eye on that to make sure it doesn't, you know, blossom out of control. But I think what's going on now seems to be appropriate and helpful to, to the situation. Uh, do we need a motion to recommend this to the mayor? I think a motion would be appropriate. It is just a recommendation, though, as Joe said. Okay. Would you like to make the motion? Well, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, extend this for 12 more months and um, have staff look into uh, the possibility of making it a permanent situation. A motion to recommend to the mayor that the um, the temporary accommodations be extended to December 31st. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. yes well, along Rob. with the extra thing about mm -hmm. the staff. What no. Robert said. Yes, okay. <laughs> Is everybody clear on the motion? Okay, great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. So that was our old business item, and now we're on to new business. Uh, first or, uh, business is discussion consideration of ordinance 22-02, capital project ordinance for the town of Duck, North Carolina. Good evening, council. Uh, you have in front of you a capital project ordinance. So this is very similar to the annual budget ordinance you adopt. Uh, the major difference being that the annual budget ordinance has an end date. This does not. So this will 
live on with our current planned beach nourishment project. So this um, ordinance allows us to recognize the revenues, um, that's grant revenue, uh, bond proceed revenue, um, and then the county's contribution, and then it authorized the expenditures for uh, the beach nourishment project. So that, that's what you have in front of you tonight. The numbers here were generated um, by Ken Wilson, um, and then you know, the Carters were involved in, in the generation of this as well. Um, Teresa helped with the, the formatting of the, of the ordinance to be sure that we have everything uh, in there that we need. Yeah, I think this makes great sense to have this, and I'd, I would have loved to have seen this for our last project, or I don't know if we can plug in numbers for, uh, for the old project, you know, at some point, not as an ordinance, but just to compare, because it is a wonderful summary of the expenses that are being um, undertaken. And so I think that's a really, I, I really loved seeing the um, outline. Anybody could easily see what the numbers are, um, uh, you know, in terms, and including, uh, including the um, cost of issuance, which I imagine is the, is the issuing of the bond and that kind of thing. That, that's correct. And when you see budget to actual, and we'll show you budget to actual for this project, similar to what we do for the, the regular budget, um, the cost of issuance, you're going to see that, that we're going to exceed that budget amount. Okay. Um, uh, oh. it's, but so when you say we're going to exceed that, does this one accurately reflect what we're actually paying? No. Th oh, okay. This is, these are the, all the projected costs. Projected, right? okay. And then the actual end ended up coming in a little bit higher. They were a little bit underestimated by our FA. So. And so not to just be the only one speaking, please, <laughs> everyone else um, ask questions, but are you... So we will see a budget to actual on this ordinance, like like we do the regular. That's correct. Budget, okay. Yeah. And I, and it, this this does um, uh, the the proceeds from the special obligation bonds. So this is sort of all new moving forward, or is this including past MSD money? So two different things. So. The MSD revenue and, and the revenue that comes from sales taxes that is restricted to beach nourishment goes into our beach nourishment fund. Okay. Beach nourishment bank account. Mm -hmm. Think about it that way. So that's where we put that revenue, the expenditures that come out of that, we transfer them within the budget and you budget for that in your annual budget money into that fund, money back out to pay for debt service. We did not in the fiscal 22 budget, budget for the beach nourishment project because we knew we were gonna do a capital project budget separate. So that the MSD revenue does not come into this project at all. The, the only real revenue for this are the, the grants, county contribution and bond proceeds. Okay. That's how the, the, the project gets funded. That's that's that helpful. Clear as mm -hmm. mud. No, that's okay. that's helpful. But I I I, I stand behind the idea of, of separating out the ordinance and um, we would. This is something going forward that any it would be great to do for any new large project like this. Like if we were going to do another beach nourishment project in five years, for example, this is the best practice in terms of going forward. So the general statutes actually require that you do this. Okay. Um, you either have to account for them in your regular general budget or you need a separate capital project budget. The, the beauty of the, of the capital project is that it does not end. So you don't have to try to figure out how much of it's gonna cross the fiscal year, which is state, set by statute as July 1 to June 30. So yeah, this just keeps everything really clean, um, crosses, you know, crosses that normal fiscal year line and will, really doesn't end until the project is, is done. So, so, Drew, this would be like the equivalent of an off-balance sheet accounting thing. So, is that true? I mean, in the sense that this doesn't flow through the budget, is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yes. And okay. if we approve this, are we, are we saying that all capital projects have to do this, or we're just approving it for this capital project? Just this one. And, you know, if we had another significant project, the only other one that may have been significant enough to do this with would, would be the, the Highway 12 elevation 
but still, that's, there's not a whole lot of money there, and if we can ever get FEMA to give us an answer, we'll, we'll know what fiscal year that's going to occur in. But to your point, you know, the, the recurring nature of our beach nourishment, it, it's a good idea to have, have an ordinance, and then the next time we do it in five years, you, do, you adopt another ordinance. Um, and the, the amount of money is not, is not insignificant here. It's a, it's a good, good chunk of change we're budgeting here. Huh. And we kept it out of the origin, our original budget. Correct. I don't know how I didn't notice that we did that. That's, this is, I, I like this way, though, if you're, for all the reasons we spoke about. Um, anybody else have any comments? Otherwise, we might entertain a motion to adopt this ordinance. I'll, I'll make the motion that we adopt the ordinance 22-02 uh, for a capital project ordinance. Okay, we have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. The next order, uh, the next item is number seven, uh, items referred and present presentations from our town attorney, Robert. Hops. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I don't have any report this evening, but certainly you can answer any questions if there are any. Nope, thank you very much. Okay, and the next is item number eight, items referred and presentations from town manager. Thank you, we'll do the uh, department updates. Um, Mr. Hurd, then Chief Black, Chief Ackerman, Ms. Legner, and Ms. Barnes. Right. Thank you once again, council members. Right. Well, this evening, um, we'll start off as usual just with a quick overview of our permit activity for the month of December. Um, we see there, there was a down a, a little bit from last year. Um, you can see in the top there with the building permits, um, we are, it was down 10% on the month, but still overall up 11% on the year. So very significant year once again. If we go all the way down to the bottom there, I'd highlighted another couple numbers where just the total permits, when we throw in all those other different types of permits, CAMA permits for coastal development, sign permits, things like that, um, we're down, it was down 14% for the month, but tracking very, very closely to where we were last year, down just very slightly from that. Um, looking at the maps and areas of development, you can see we've got some areas up um, Sanderlin, a little cluster there, as well as in and around Carolina Dunes. The southern part of town um, have a good amount of activity there in the Schooner Ridge neighborhood, as well as the neighborhoods just north of that, um, Bayberry Bluffs, and some of the other ones that adjoin the, the eastern side of Duck Village. New construction permits um, issued one last month for East Seahawk Drive and um, had a very substantial amount of significant additions. So the, these are all, when I use the word substantial, these are all six figures is what I'm, that's the cutoff point I'm using. So um, that's a really large number of projects that are going to be getting underway um, here shortly to, you know, to improve these properties here. Um, moving on to other town projects, um, those of you, particularly those who live up on the northern part of town, um, will have noticed that our duck trail improvements have begun. Um, Fred Smith Company began demolition today. And for those who are unfamiliar, that is formerly RPC. Oh, right. They've been bought out by a larger company toward the center of the state, um, Fred Smith Company, but the same, a lot of the same people involved here in their local office. Um, they were the, the bidders who were awarded this contract. Um, we anticipate completion of the project in its entirety within 30 days, according to them. Um, they have 60 under the contract. They have to be done by um, early March, but they don't anticipate any issues with that at all. 
And again, this is taking place between where the previous project ended, between Blue Heron Lane and going all the way down to the northern part of Oyster Catcher Lane intersection there. Um, if you'll recall, we had, haven't had an update on this in a little while, but our rain garden and wetlands sign, that is actually the final design for it, um, completed by our Eagle Scout. Um, we have installed a temporary sign. Um, you can see the scouts from Troop 165 there um, working on that. We do anticipate receiving the permanent sign, which will be larger and glossier, um, on January the 10th, and then this sign will be moved to the back of the rain garden where people on that little meandering path between mm -hmm. Town Hall and the, the playground um, will be able to view it from there. Um, so that, that'll be done. By the time we next meet, that, that'll all be in place as far as the, the permanent sign mm -hmm. there at the eastern edge of the rain garden. We, we, we talk, had a lot of discussion about where to, where to locate it. Um, whether we wanted it up closer to the sidewalk, but we didn't want to take away from the, the photographic opportunities offered by our, the horse there. That's one of our prime mm -hmm. spots where we see a lot of folks taking pictures and we didn't want to assign to disturb that view. <laughs> um, beach grass planting, we've already completed seven so far this year, nearly 30,000 sprigs and 100 volunteer hours. Um, did want to highlight that our next opportunity is going, you know, weather permitting will be tomorrow, um, 2 p.m., and this will be at the southern beach access in Four Seasons. Okay, so the southern one from there. Beach renourishment had a lot of really positive things fall into place over the last month. Um, CAMA, Division of Water Resources, Corps of Engineers permits issued. We obtained our lease for the offshore sand, um, the borrow area there um, from Boehm. The contract was signed with Weeks Marine. That, that is through the county, not directly through the towns. LGC approved and our financing is in place. And construction is still on schedule for summer 2022. We should be getting, with the contract signed, Weeks Marine does plan um, to, to have somebody appointed as the project manager. Once that individual is appointed, we'll get down to some of the more nuts and bolts within pretty short order as far as a schedule, you know, where they plan to start, you know, what kind of resources they're, they're gonna be using, that kind of thing. So we should ho hopefully within the next, it, it'll be maybe a month, maybe two, um, we'll have some idea of when they're going to be active in the town of Duck and we will begin to pass that message out to our community so that people can plan accordingly. So again, all, and all of that would just be estimates, but it'll at least give people a good idea of whether we're gonna be on the front end of the project in May or the tail end of the project in September, October timeframe. Um, Brick grant, um, both of our requested grant extensions have been approved um, with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as far as Dare County Tourism Board. So um, we don't have to worry about losing any of the matching funding as a result of the, the delays with the BRIC grant. Um, we are ready to submit for permits. Um, VHB has completed everything and they're, they're holding that until we, until they, we need some information from them to begin to obtain easements on the east side of the project that are, that are related not to the living shoreline, but to the the roads and the extension as we elevate the road, the apron that goes into some of those side roads, um, that kind of thing. Um, Duck Ridge Shores um, situation with their easement is solutions are coming together for them um, as far as acquiring that, that property from the heirs of the original developers. And so that's resolving. And we're still awaiting our, our official notice um, on the, from FEMA on the BRIC grant itself. 
um, before we can move forward more aggressively with this. So that's where we're at with that. And now I'd like to ask um, Jim Gould, our new community planner, to come up and just share a little bit of information with you about two things that he's been working on. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <coughs> Good evening, members of council. Uh, if you haven't been made familiar with this piece of equipment, it might be easily missed here. Um, this is our bicycle and pedestrian counter. On the right-hand side there, you see a little wooden post. It's very inconspicuous. Um, and what this does is it counts uh, passers-by just north of Four Seasons along Duck Trail. So it'll count pedestrian and bicycle usage. Um, this has been there actually since 2016. And uh, right now we've um, been just collecting data. And you might ask why collect data? Because basically if you don't count it, it doesn't count. So the data can become useful here in the future for, for grant applications. Um, to make arguments along things along as maybe parking, something like that could come into play with this information. This is some of the information that we collected from the um, eco counter, is what it's called. It's called the eco counter. And this reflects the daily totals from 2021. Uh, you'll see some of our spikes here. We're definitely during the summer months. In the spring, there you can see some high usage around Easter time. Uh, that was definitely our biggest usage day. And then if you notice as we slide down towards the end of November, we have another large spike. And uh, that could probably be attributed to the Advice 5K. Here's the actual weekly breakdown. And you see the black line there is actually Thursday. And I don't know if you can quite see the hours down there at the bottom, but we had a huge spike between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. And then a little drop. And then right after the race, probably, we'll see a, another huge spike up to 150 people around 11 a.m. So this is sort of the, the neat and useful information that we can collect from this counter. Uh, this is a breakdown, a daily weekday breakdown of usage over the year. And with this, you can see not only which days are the busiest, but also which hours of the day are so we see here the total usage is up in the morning time around the hours of 8. Sorry, I don't know if you haven't been able to hear me at all. Between the hours of 8 and 9 a.m. Uh, we actually see the highest pedestrian usage around 9 a.m. And then shortly thereafter, we get the highest bicycle usage. So Mondays and Tuesdays at the beginning of the week are definitely our busiest days. And then Friday is actually our slowest day for usage. So. Maybe people are just into relaxing on the beach that last day of their vacation or something along those lines, but kind of neat to point out. And I will say that thinking about some of the bicycle usage, which I didn't highlight specifically in these graphs, we probably get a lot more bicycle usage than the graphs ever will reflect because they're riding on the road. You know, they're not on duck trail in particular. This is a second item that Joe asked me to uh, tackle recently, and it is a breakdown of our businesses by type in the village commercial district or the uh, village conventional, commercial conventional district, as it's called. Um, <clears throat> I find this interesting uh, because it just is information that hasn't been really displayed before. We do have 54% of the businesses as retail businesses in this area. So um, that is our, our largest population. And then you can see there's 31 or roughly 24% of our businesses as restaurants. I do have a breakdown here that I'll go ahead and pass out. It helps describe some of the categories that I've created for these. But uh, basically, you know, when it comes to selecting the categories, I had to kind of finally make my own decision. So when you have, for example, a business like Aqua Spa and Restaurant, I categorized it under restaurant. So in the future, if you have any questions about these categories or any need to reach out to all the restaurants that we have in this district, I now have that information at my disposal. 
so I can quickly get you a spreadsheet of all of the restaurants or all of the retail general businesses in this VCC zone. So in this VC zone. Interesting. Are there any questions about this? No, I think information? it's. I think it's nice the way you drop, you broke retail out since it is such a large percentage, and seeing it in these different categories is is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe in the future, you know, as as we start to get new business proposals, we can see, you know, where they're going to be located spatially and how they might interact with you know the businesses that we already have in the whole zone, and then even more locally in that particular shopping center, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so. Jim, does this count take into account any of the empty stores in the uh, two centers? So I didn't actually count the empty stalls. Okay. Yeah, the empty units were not part of this. So these were only occupied units. So the 127 is a large enough. We have more than 127 businesses. Available spaces, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I will say, um, since my this is my first month, essentially, with this town, I have received only positive comments about this town. I find, I'm, I'm being honest with this, and I, I find that pretty um, spectacular. And it, it speaks a lot to what you all have done to develop such a wonderful community. So, and I've, been, I've met a lot of people. And sorry if I've forgotten your name, but uh, please feel free to remind me. <laughs> hey, hey, Jim, just a, just a question. So would it be helpful? Does that include walking on the boardwalk? Yes. That, that, that's that anybody who does the whole thing, boardwalk, yes, and then would go on the duck trail all the way up as far as it goes to so the So the crawl. counter, you mean the pedestrian Where, Where's the, the counter would catch people going on the, uh, oh, yeah. on the boardwalk as well as? Mm -hmm. no. So, Councilman Chiano, it's a good thing to mention because we are looking at getting more of these counters. Yeah. But for the time being, we only have the one. Okay. And it is right in this dip, sort of just north of the Four Seasons. Um, oh, okay. I know, where, I know where that is. And, uh, but we, we would love to capture more information on the maybe the northern part of Duck Trail. And then there is discussion, too, about you know, appropriate spacing on, on the boardwalk. So. Yeah. That would be good, I think. I. I Agree. <laughs> because I, I think we're just, I mean, be, you know, if you don't pass through that, you're not getting recorded. Right. You know, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do with this data, but it'll probably be helpful in making some decisions. Exactly. Some and you got to think about, too, all of the arteries that we're missing that are, you know, right here next yeah. to this village commercial district coming yeah. straight into our town. So you can guarantee that the traffic that we receive on Duck Trail is maybe even exponentially higher than what's being recorded by this piece of equipment. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that we've got, this has been in place since 2016, I seem to remember, so it's nice that it's still working, because we've, we've replaced the vehicle counters a few different times, and I think technology's improved, so maybe when it's time to add a new counter or two or three along the pedestrian pass, maybe the technology will be even better, but this is pretty good for lasting five years to give yeah. us the data. We do uh, maintain it. We do have to go out and wipe off the lenses that, that mm -hmm. collect some of the information, and we make sure that the battery is replaced every two years. So we have done a pretty good job at maintaining it over the years, too. Mm -hmm. So, And you, you really you'd never know it's there unless it's pointed out to you. So nice piece of equipment. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great, Jim. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. And I, and I miscalled the name, so Chief Black is not going to present tonight. Uh, Deputy Chief Bachelet's going to do the fire department's presentation. Oh, good. Soon. He's dried off. He's <laughs> you dry were off. pretty wet when you came in here tonight. Thank you guys for the opportunity tonight. Chief was out of town last week and uh, got in late last night, so I had the privilege of putting this together for today. So uh, to get started with, if you haven't, if I haven't met you before, I'm Trey Bachelet, I'm the Deputy Fire Chief. Uh, I'll get started real quick here, and this will be a much shorter one. Uh, our calls for service is where we'll start off with for December. I will start off with our year-to-date numbers. So this is going to be the total that we had for the year. 
Um, we ended up at 543 this year. It's slightly higher than last year, and we kind of saw that coming with our busy summer, especially. Um, our extended shoulders certainly helped. We did see a little bit of a downturn in December of this year compared to last year, and this, of course, shows the last five years, um, but we're still kind of holding across the board there. Uh, and then here, of course, this is just showing that breakdown of where those calls kind of landed. Uh, you can see that we were very heavy in fire alarm activations this year. Last year, we were higher in our EMS calls. Um, this last slide that kind of shows these breakdowns here is just that, that pie chart that'll show you kind of where we broke out. You can see we were really over 50% fire calls and only about a third of our call volume was actually EMS. Granted, the numbers are small, but still holding to that trend. Um, so our activities for the month, you can see again, our total incidents were 17. Um, our fire inspections are ramped up and in full force at this point. We were able to do 25 in the month of December, which is a lot considering that we lose a couple weeks around the holidays for that. Um, and then our training hours, of course, our 242 hours, which broke out to 152, came from our career staff, and then our volunteer staff provided 90 of those. So one thing I was gonna talk on tonight is our other duties as assigned. Uh, a common question that we'll get is, what are you doing when you're not on a call? Uh, so I, I, there's a hundred different things I could talk about. I picked these six, uh, they, they're kind of the top six, if you will. For us, training is, really priority number one, and that is a year-round event for us. If we're not on a call, the odds are the guys are getting some type of training in. Um, this time of year with the lower call volume lends to an increase in those numbers to what we can get because we don't have the interruptions, but that is, is definitely a priority for us. Uh, our inspections are more seasonal. We don't like to do those in the summer. Obviously, the calls provide for interruptions. In addition to that, we don't want to interrupt the business, the flow of the business for those businesses during their peak season. Uh, maintenance, that is a year-round event for us again. We are constantly doing, whether it's building maintenance, apparatus maintenance, tools and equipment maintenance, there, there's always something that needs to be repaired, fixed, tweaked. Uh, so that's, that is one of those year-round between the call moments. Uh, service testing, we actually tend to do that more in the off-season. It gives us a little more time to dedicate to that and we're not as interrupted by our call volume. And service testing for us would be uh, our pumps requ are required to be service tested annually, our hoses, our fire extinguishers, our SCBA units, things of that nature. Cleaning, we clean every day. Um, think of it this way, they are there for 24 hours, our duty crews are, are in the station, that's their house. All of that house cleaning that you normally do, they do on a daily basis. Um, probably the cleanest building in town. <laughs> uh, hydrants, this again is an off-season object for us. Um, it's something that we really shoot for off-season. We've got less people in town. We don't disrupt things as much, but we, we do like to get out there and get them checked, get reflectors down where reflectors are missing, get the, the caps off, get the hydrants spun open, report any issues that we have to Dare County that actually takes care of that. Um, Last thing I wanted to go over was we did have our annual awards banquet on December 4th, um, and we had to honor all of our award winners for the year, so I'm just gonna, I could say an hour's worth of stuff about each of these people, but I'm just gonna go through and kind of give you who got what here. Um, our Rookie of the Year was one of our new career members, uh, Firefighter Greg Fiala. Our Volunteer Firefighter of the Year and Peer Award winner was actually for the second year in a row, um, Ralph Allison. Um, Nancy Cavanis, of course, got the Chief's Award, and that is, that is an award that's given out by the Chief and, and was really neat to be able to give to her this year because she's got such a long storied career there and, and has done so much there over her time and, and had never gotten that award before. Wow, surprising uh, she's never gotten that. And then uh, our Career Firefighter of the Year was Engineer Brandon Boyd. Um, he is, I, I could talk for hours, he was actually my number two when I was a captain, so I, I, that was... That was an honor there. Um, and then Matt Munden, engineer Matt Munden, uh, received a five-year service pin as well. And with that, if you guys have any questions, if not, I will hand it over. I just have one question about the hydrants. Do you try uh -huh. to uh, look at the hydrants, um, all the hydrants in one year, or do you have to split them up? So we look, we split the town into three sections because we have three shifts, of course. 
Um, and each of those shifts will get a section across the town. So every hydrant is getting in space. It's not one person doing every single hydrant, but across the three shifts, they will do through the, really through a four or five month period, they will put hands on and check every single hydrant in town. That's great. And that's a, that is in addition to Dare County does their own maintenance piece. This just gives us the ability to put eyes on it, kind of helps them and, and can point out maybe any issues that we see uh, that they've missed. Great, thank you. Thank really you. good report. Thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Jeff. Get uh, this up here. I promise to keep it brief. You're going to have to do it, Chief. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. Yep. We had a, a technology breakdown. We're trying to get it so Ms. Legner can control that from the back, but it broke. Sorry about that. All right, and we're rolling. Okay, so we really hit the ground running. Uh, 2022, we, it seems like when December rolls around, and I can't believe 2021 is already over, but we, it, it's hurry up, get everything done. Um, by the end of December, and then clock turns over and, and we're going again. So a um, lot of things going on in the background uh, to get ready for the season coming up. A um, lot of preparation for training, budgets, uh, state reporting, um, big projects we're working on right now is a purge of evidence and property. It takes quite a bit of time to get through that, try to get that done before we um, roll into the the rest of the year and, and the people start coming back. So um, that's really on the administrative side. On the other side, the officers are really out there checking homes, trying to be visible, addressing um, issues that citizens are bringing up, which kind of segues me over into our next uh, slide. Rob, I want to thank you for being a, uh, helping be a leader on one of the issues we've been dealing with, which is um, school bus safety. We've had a number of concerns um, with a school bus stop on the southern end of the town that we've been, been meeting to address and we're making headway on that. A um, couple of things that have come out of that is one, we, we're uh, trying to put another radar speed sign there. The sign is here. We identified funds within our existing budget to do it. We've just run into a small stag with um, DOT and exactly where the placement of the 25 mile an hour zone is. It oh. seems there's a discrepancy between our ordinance and what, uh, what DOT is mm -hmm. actually place the sign. So we're working through that. Engineer has promised to be on the ground, come out there and look at us so we can get that resolved and uh, get that sign up as quick as possible. Another thing that really um, we, we haven't done the greatest job on is speed enforcement. And that's something I certainly accept. Um, we're going to be step, stepping that up. So you'll, you'll see the officers out there a lot more gone through a lot of tra training issues over the last year with new staff. I'm happy to report now that 100% of our staff have completed BLET. They are fully certified. And the, the last few will have completed radar training by February. So we'll have 100% of our patrol officers able to enforce speed. Um, the reason we do it is to increase safety. Um, that's the only reason we, we do speed enforcement. In fact, I've, I've explained to council and the public before that it actually costs the town quite a bit of money to, it, to enforce speed. We don't make any revenue off of traffic tickets in North Carolina. So uh, the concept of a speed trap in Duck is, is completely false. So you will be seeing the officers out there more, increased uh, visibility, and uh, I, with that will come complaints, and we understand that um, we're willing to to step up to that, and I know that council will also support us on that, that it is for the, it is for the, the safety of our, our public and our community, so. Um, just quickly through our stats, um, traffic enforcement actions you'll see went up quite a bit. And when I say traffic enforcement actions, that's not always a criminal citation. Sometimes that may be a, a written warning, verbal warning, depending on the situation. So depending on what we're dealing with, there's a number of ways the officer can choose to deal with that. Motor vehicle crashes way down, business checks were up. Um, ex patrols had a number of, of year-round residents out of town that asked us to watch over their properties over the holidays, and then only one DWI arrest in December. 
Um, our LPR stats are up. We included um, at the end the New Year's Eve um, weekend there, so we rolled over one day into January just to give you a picture as to where where we are with that. Um, one thing, the, the new radar sign we intend to put up will have a traffic statistics package. It will be perfectly positioned for folks coming into town for us to be able to capture a lot more traffic statistics with that sign that we haven't been able to do or where our LPR has been, been lacking in that. So I hope that's something we can begin to bring back to you. Um, sorry, overall call volumes. Uh, we ended the year on a fairly high note. Uh, let's see, duck um, overall call volume for 2021 was 12,837 calls. So um, it, it was kind of a strange year in how those calls flowed throughout the year, but overall, um, it, it was a, uh, it wasn't the highest year 2018, still, or 2019 rather, uh, ranks up as our highest year, and that's an anomaly that we just haven't been able to explain um, because our, our uh, tourism population has been significantly up over the last year. And lastly, just wanted to share some interesting statistics that I got from the communication center about uh, kind of the activity that goes on, not just in Duck, but throughout the county. So. Uh, 129,136 uh, law enforcement calls were handled in the county. Um, of that, 28,000 were dispatched, uh, just over 100,000 were officer initiated. Um, for Duck, our, uh, our self-initiated calls were 11,313 and our dispatch calls were 1,524. Um, the, the reason for the discrepancies, a dispatch call generally is a call that comes in to 911. Those tend to be your high priority emergency calls. Many of the other calls might come in through the station, might come in direct to the officer, or the officer observes something and handles it. So our self-initiated activity tends to be much higher than our dispatched activity. Um, 7,342 fire rescue calls. Um, 9,100 EMS calls, 353 med flight calls, and one statistic I found very interesting, and there is a, a typo on here. Uh, they did not answer, okay, I, I see what it is, I apologize. They answered 38,528 911 calls. I'm sorry, when I first glanced at that, I thought it was in the millions, and oh, yeah. that wasn't correct. Um, and interestingly enough, they broke it down from uh, landline phones and cell phones. So you can see landline phones are certainly um, taking a back seat. Uh, one of the most interesting statistics I saw is that they answered 84,000 nine emergency phone calls at our communication center and then our radio every time somebody makes a transmission. So 748,000 radio transmissions in 2021. So uh, just some interesting statistics there that we received. So um, any questions tonight? I'll try to keep it fairly brief. I have a question, or but you go first. Um, whatever happened, the, I forget the guy's name that we talked to from transportation. Did uh, he, did he get, supply the information to you that he was he, supposed he to? He did. He did. Are you talking about the bus? Yes. Yes, he gave us the uh, GPS tracking. Is that what you're referring to? Correct. On that, yes. We have that functional now. So um, it was given to one. They would only give us one license for it. So that officer's working on a way to make sure everyone can access it. So it's a little more limited than we'd hoped, but uh, uh, but it's still helpful. Were, were were there any motorists identified that were zooming past the bus? Just one. Just one. The, the additional information or additional pictures he was able to get us showed kind of what we talked about in the meeting, passing in, in the same time that the sign was deploying. So those weren't, but we certainly did identify one person. We uh, still haven't located that person, but we're still going to try to make a case on that. And haven't been any since. Of course, we had the holiday break, so they're really getting ramped up now with that. My, Jeff, uh, are we, yeah, uh, oh, you go ahead, Tom. Are we fully staffed yet? We're still down one. Um, we had certainly hoped, I think I told you a, a short while ago, that we hoped to have filled that last position. The, we uh, did held interviews. The one person we were most hopeful for backed out at the last minute for over housing. Um, we have another interview scheduled for tomorrow. So I'm hoping out of the, the two remaining candidates, we'll be able to choose one and, and get fully staffed. Thank you. So. And great. I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, you mentioned about um, 
the speeding and the fact that you were not, uh, that you sort of feel like we haven't been enforcing speeding. How are you determining that? Um, and, and I'm just curious about how you came around to that because it's the first time I'm hearing about it. It, it seems like, but I, again, I just, I was just curious how that, wh where you come up with the idea that you need to do more. Um, is it just public comment or is it, it's kind of it from the data or what I think is? there's two two components to that one it has been in the back of my mind for a while and, and a lot of that is transitional and what I mean by that is 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 the officers we have over the years we've gone through different types of officers some that are very heavily motivated by traffic enforcement and the staff that we've tended to have is more interested in, in community engagement more interested in and getting out of the car and less interested in traffic enforcement. And that's something we're seeing with the younger officers that are coming in. Um, in general terms, you would, when you look at speeding enforcement, you look at traffic crash data. And we're really fortunate when we look at our traffic crash data that the reasons for the, the vast majority of our crashes are, are uh, traffic backups or the crosswalks. Um, so for, for us, that is not a traditional thing, so it becomes one public comment, and I've heard from several people, you know, Duck used to be known as the place you don't speed through. And, it, and recently I've heard, you know, now we feel like you look at it and it's, you don't enforce speeding anymore, and we're seeing cars go too fast. And then it becomes personal observation in what I see. And it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it a round the clock problem. Um, it tends to be specific times of the day when, when we, I think we all know we have a rush hour now in Duck, totally. <laughs> which is something we never had. And I, I do see a lot of people hurrying in the morning to get out of town, and then I see it reverse around 5 o'clock, and there's a lot of folks uh, uh, going um, back the other way. In a traditional speed enforcement environment, we'd be able to address an area very heavily, write tickets, get the message out, but a lot of our folks are, are transient. So that, that doesn't work as a strategy for us. Mm -hmm. as well so you know I, I wish I could just put my finger on that and say there was, there was one thing or something but it it had when I look at the stats and I look at what the officers are doing I tend to see very heavy on the other side of things and I don't want that to be neglected and I don't mean to say we're going to go out there and we're going to turn into the duck highway patrol and write thousands of tickets a year because that's not necessary we don't have that sort of a speeding problem but we do have a, and especially this time of year when our traffic is light, and you can um, move through. People town. forget, mm -hmm. and they come through, and that's why I point out that that a traffic enforcement doesn't have to be a costly citation. Somebody that's that's a year-round resident commuting through Duck every day to Corolla, then being stopped and getting a warning ticket is probably all it's going to take to remind them slow down going through town. So, yeah. so I don't mean to say we're going to be heavy-handed, but we are going to be out there. We are going to be visible, and we are going to address the the higher speeds. For sure. I, I think that's a good idea. I also think those signs that light up with your speed, I think they're helpful because you said it, a lot of people that don't really realize they're going too fast and then that sign lights up and they say, whoa. Yeah. And then you that's come a back big down, reminder. You know? So that's I think that's a helpful tool. It is, you know, the speed limit does change a number of times coming yeah, through and does. that's that's a complaint of a lot of people. I'm, yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've got kids in the car, I'm focusing on something, I've got a phone call and they forget. and. Instantly, the radar sign that is missing up here, uh, just for the core, uh, we believe it got hit by lightning. So it is in the shop for uh, uh, repair. So that's okay. why that's not there. We hope to get that back up soon. Yeah, those are really helpful tools. And I think for what they cost, um, roughly $6,000, um, They we've had good longevity out of them, and I think they're highly effective in, in the education piece. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, right. Chief. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Evening. All right, I will get rolling here with everyone's favorite subject, and that is trash. Yay. 
Um, <laughs> before I get into the what you see here is one of the stickers, um, I did have a message from Sandy Cross. Um, this week has been trying for trash collection in the town of Duck, and waste management has been affected both by the weather and by apparently some pretty large COVID staffing problems. Uh, collection was not completed today. There were some homes that were not collected today, and they have said it will be completed tomorrow. Um, so Sandy wanted me to relay that, that we are very dismayed by the service um, that we had this week, and that, that hopefully that can be brought up during the weekly meeting on Tuesday, correct, Mr. Town Manager? And um, hopefully we can discuss some sort of plan for weather incidents to make sure that that we have a plan in place and we can get the, the word out really easily. So that is from Sandy Cross. For the change in the trash schedule on January 31st, that will go back to the Monday schedule in the off season and then Monday, Friday in the high season. Uh, we will be receiving all of our stickers uh, in the middle of next week. And so what we've chosen to do is because we felt and heard from the council that it was very important to make it very, very clear to people when cans needed to go out and when they needed to come back in, we do have this sticker right here. This is appropriate for both recycling cans and trash cans. It doesn't matter which one it goes on. People will still see very brightly in red when the cans should be rolled out and rolled back in. I understand we, we still have quite a bit of out public outreach to do for rental companies and things like that, but we wanted to make it very clear with one sticker, not, not cluttered with the schedule, just what the cans are supposed to do and where they're supposed to be. Our second sticker is for the trash cans, and you'll notice that both of these have a QR code on them. <coughs> the QR code is the same. It goes to the same website, and so I've redesigned our trash web pages a bit, and this QR code goes to an updated web page that has all of the residential curbside collection items on one page. <coughs> and so I, I just have the, the top of the page screenshotted here, but if they go to this page, if, if a homeowner or a visitor goes to this page, they can, there's links everywhere, they can find out about their curbside trash and their curbside recycling in the same location. And then on the right, we have quick links where they can also find out about the bulk waste <laughs> curbside pickup and other types of, of curbside collection. Um, I just tried to make it very simple. So no matter what the schedule is, no matter what, when they, when they scan that QR code, they'll be taken directly to where, and if you can use the links on the top left to just hop down the page to the applicable items, or you can scroll through the page and you can find access to everything. So those will be arriving, the stickers will be arriving the middle of next week, and um, Betsy is going to put out a call to volunteers to assist us, and on Wednesday when I, when I have the stickers in hand, I will be contacting the uh, property management companies and the rollback companies again as well uh, for, so they can pick up stickers if they would like and we'll be putting out information for homeowners who might want to pick up their own stickers and, and place them. So we will get those rolling out. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the recycling FAQs or under the curbside recycling, I was, yes. is that where we list what can be recycled? Yes. Or, that's and Because I, I wasn't sure if it was there or maybe over where it says residential recycling. So those both go to the same place if you right. click residential right. recycling. Um, we do have our flyers that have, and I don't have copies of those, I'm sorry, the recyclable and non-recyclable items that the state made for us working with TFC. And then the FAQs TFC has provided me web links where people can read exactly. So they can click on plastic and they can see every plastic item that TFC, you know, will accept or not accept, and that's updated by TFC. Great. Christian, can I ask you a question? So yes, sir. Just explain this again to me. You, the stickers, that sticker that you put up there, right? Mm -hmm. People are gonna have to scan that, that uh, QR thing to get to figure out when it goes out? Yes, but we will have all of the information on our website and our brochure and items like that. I don't mean to be critical, but we can't get people to answer an email, much less look at this sign, scan something else, and then go read it in the third place. This, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm predicting a disaster with this. 
this is just, it's too much, people are not gonna do it. Right, so we, we did design this, talking to our municipalities that have had a lot, have had a lot of trash schedule changes. And they were finding that it was more difficult to make sure all of the stickers were replaced. So when there was an actual date on the sticker, if they couldn't get them all out, if people, if stickers fell off, then they had a date that was completely incorrect, rather than letting people know where to find I, I just think that it's, you know, people are, inherently lazy and ap apathetic about things and and this is I just I'm afraid it's going to be a problem well we are certainly especially, happy especially for like renters and things right and we're cer certainly happy to review if it's not working what are we doing with the old stickers that are on there oh what we'll cover them up them? what excuse me uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover them up okay with the other with the new stickers yes um but we, I will look at that when the stickers arrive. We did make sure that they are sized appropriately so that they're, they can cover or be in the same location where we had the other stickers. Christian, I have a question. Yes, sir. So in our neighborhood in Sandling, we have a, the North Sandling, we have the roll in and roll mm -hmm. out. So the service puts the stickers on for us. They, they may, they did last time, so yeah, they, I will be contacting them again. So what are the other, how do we get them in the other neighborhoods? Do we send them individually to the property owners through the mail or what? Um, what we? Well, rollback services do cover some of the other neighborhoods. Okay. Some property management companies last time uh, collected stickers and, and put, had their housekeepers put them on trash cans. Okay. And we also utilize staff and volunteers pretty heavily. Okay. Mr. Whitman can speak to that. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> and it is a property management. Um, it's gonna be ongoing conversations with property management companies to get this information appropriately out to the guests because it's an ongoing every week is a whole new you know group. Mm -hmm. Certainly our year round residents and even um, uh, folks that uh, use this area for second homes are going to become familiar with the trash schedule. So it is just a, every week of a new education thing. I may have mentioned before that we started in, in my company uh, texting mm -hmm. the night before and it was a huge um, improvement this year because of that. So that kind of, all the new technology that you can avail yourself of uh, will help, and I, it's it's a it's a heavy lift. There's no question about it. Um, but I think it, it this is a good start, and um, people will you know it's it's not going to just be the can. It's got to be more people telling people about the trash. Because you're right, they need to be told. They can't even then they're told at the beginning of their stay, and even if they're told in their arrival before arrival information, mm -hmm. you get them on a text. You know, take your trash can out, and they're going to be like, oh, okay, got it. You know. And that's something we've heard from property management companies that, and, and quite frankly from the council during previous discussions is that even though we had the dates quite plainly on the trash cans before, they still weren't getting rolled in and rolled out. So uh, we're just, we're trying a different tactic to see if we can figure it out. The great thing is, is that I can track uh, how many people come to the webpage from the QR code. So that's something I'll be keeping metrics on. Oh, interesting. You know, I'm, I'm not sure, pardon my newness here, I'm not sure this is the right place to bring this up or not, but trash seems to be a, a wonderful problem for us. I mean, it comes up all the time and it, and it seems to be the root of a lot of problems. But I'm wondering if, um, you know, because we've got renters and people who are here sometime and then not here other times, they roll it out, they leave, there's no one to roll it in, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, should we as a town just just contract roll in, roll out 365 and just make it part of our town expenses and allocate it back as we normally would any other service? I mean, that would solve our problem. or It would, it would solve a big piece of our problem. And... Um, I mean, it, it, there is a cost. It's not a phenomenally high cost, because I know what it costs for us in, in Sanderling, and I think you get your money's worth for it if you have a good service. And then you could be sure that cans go out when they're supposed to, cans come back when they're supposed to, um, they get labeled properly. If they're overstuffed, they can deal with that or, or tell someone or whatever. I don't know. I just put that out as an item I think we should explore. I'll make a good, uh, not a good suggestion, but a suggestion that if you would 
put a pin in that and let's bring that up at the mid-month meeting when we're talking about okay. some of your goals. Okay, great, we will yep. do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Drew. Um, speaking a little bit about the beach nourishment, Joe gave a really fantastic overview. I did wanna let the council know that the county and all the municipal PIOs are meeting on Wednesday. Um, they have The county has created uh, quite a bit of collateral material and we'll be creating more as we get the uh, schedule and then each town will be able to share that material and and or um, make it for our own town. I have updated the website. Um, I, I've been updating it with, you know, kind of where we were in the process. So right now it does reflect that we, um, or Dare County has signed the contract and the map has been on there, it's an interactive map just like last time. So right now it just shows the complete area where the nourishment is planned to take place. And it gives the information that as soon as we get the contract, or I'm sorry, the schedule that we'll have it on there. So uh, I am updating this as soon as we get any new information. And uh, once we meet with the county, I'll have more information about everywhere the outreach is going. And I do know the county has a small budget for print and digital advertising too. Uh, another interesting tidbit is the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services has found gypsy moths in duck as well as some other areas on the Outer Banks. These are invasive species that harm our native trees and so they're proposing a treatment. I do not fully understand the treatment, but they will be having a public input meeting on February 8th. We do have this information on our website, and there is a direct link where you can find out more about the treatments and you can put your public comment if you won't be able to come to the meeting. So any information I have, I'll continue to share under that section. Just a few quick updates I will run through. The winter celebration of community, we that will be at the Sanderling this year on Friday, January 21st. The invitations have gone out and we are in those very final detail plannings. Um, the 20th anniversary event, currently Betsy is working very hard with the Wall Decor Committee and there will be a special exhibit that'll be up for three months about the last 20 years of Duck. I'm very excited about that. And we're starting to dig into the details of an event that we will plan for Sunday, May 1st, which is the 20th anniversary. So there'll be entertainment, food vendors, things like that. That's also, we will be merging it this year with a volunteer appreciation party and we would plan to every year near or around the birthday have a volunteer appreciation party going forward. So big, big anniversary years, they'll probably be merged. What month would that be or when would that be? May, May 1st. May 1st. Mm -hmm. And I do, I'm starting to uh, get advertising deadlines together for things that will come out in the spring. So I'll be rolling out that logo uh, in print advertising then and digitally as well. Let's see. Uh, we're just getting ready to start meeting with potential sponsors for summer and the Duck Jazz Festival. A lot of our sponsors for the Jazz Festival obviously are returning PNC, the Outer Banks Tourism Bureau, a lot of those but we are gonna be working very hard, Betsy and I both are looking for new potential sponsors for the upcoming year. 2020 brochure is on deck. And I did want to thank the council and the town manager for allowing me the time to, the last week of January, I'll be taking the FEMA advanced PIO course. I'm very excited about that. And um, at the beginning of February, oops, quite a few of us from the town will be uh, uh, contributing to a tabletop oil spill exercise with Dare County Emergency Management. Oh. And my last little tiny tidbit is I'm working on some, getting some quotes for meeting hall audio so we can get the LPDI grant application in. And I just wanted to end on a fun thing. We had a lot of volunteer hours in 2021, even though we started events quite late, we had less events, um, we had smaller events. So, our volunteers really <laughs> came out in a big way. So everything from any of our any of our summer events, concerts, magic, to Yuletide, to Duck Sweet Beach planning and the sound cleanups, those are just a few of the ways that our community showed us some love in 2021. And I just wanna say, uh, speaking for both myself and Betsy, that our volunteers are truly a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> and we are very thankful every day. 
That's wonderful. And that's all I have. I did just want to plug very quickly. I left the Beach Vitex picture in here because our destination dare has come out and it features Sandy Cross showing how to identify and report Beach Vitex. And that is on our webpage and our YouTube page and it'll be going out in the e-news as well. We'll try and get the news everywhere. Great. And that's all I have. Do you have any more questions? I'll, I will plan to um, prepare some reports to follow along with the metrics for the trash stickers so we can, see, can rate success. Right. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Christian. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hey. So I'm going to start with our monthly cash balances. So as you can see, um, December, our funds on hand were substantially larger. That is due to the bond proceeds for the beach nourishment that we closed on in mid-December. Um, without those bond proceeds, we are still about 36% higher than we were at this time last fiscal year um, for total funds on hand. Um, the account balances, you'll notice here that we now have three additional bank accounts for the Beach Nourishment um, bond proceeds. First, we have the 2021A bond account that is the town's portion and what the state and um, county proceeds will be deposited into. Um, then we have the FEMA 2021 loan fund. Um, this allows us to pay invoices ahead of receiving those grant funds. And then lastly, we have the sinking fund for FEMA. Um, where FEMA will deposit the grant deposits um, to pay off that FEMA um, loan fund at one year maturity. The town ended December with approximately $767,964 in the general checking account, and then the remaining funds are in the investment accounts. Um, here you will see the total revenue collections for the year compared to the budget as well as the prior fiscal year in December. We received the sales and use tax for September collections. They were just over 168,000, which was a 5.8% increase. Um, ABC and mixed beverage taxes were collected for the quarter ending September 30th. They were just above 30,000, which was a 19% increase compared to the same quarter last year. Um, November property taxes were collected in December. They were just over 1.7 million. Um, we also received December 1st through December 14th collections from the county as well. Um, this brings the town to 77% collected for the fiscal year. The utility transfer tax was also received for the quarter ending September 30th. Um, it was just over one, sorry, 128,000. Um, and then we also received the occupancy tax for October collections um, in the amount of $118,713. Um, this is a significant increase compared to last year, but as I've stated before, um, we are reporting one month behind compared to last year. Oh, and the town also received the third beach nourishment um, grant payment from the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Um, that was $362,730. Also with the expenditures, um, this is just a comparison again with the budget and the prior year totals. Overall, the expenses were in budget. Um, certain expenses do reflect a larger portion has been sent, I'm sorry, spent as so far in December 2021. This is because of certain expenses that are paid at the beginning of the fiscal year workers' comp, general liability, um, and dues and subscriptions. There were also some professional services expenses that were not originally budgeted. We'll be doing a budget amendment um, for the traffic study once we receive the final invoice. We have made the final principal and interest debt service payment to PNC Bank for the 2017 Beach Nourishment Project. Um, that was in the amount of $1,403,600. I'm sorry, $1,403,601. And then lastly, um, the revenue versus expenditures. December, we were up 260,000 compared to the expenditures. Does anybody have any questions for me? 
I just had, I had one question. Yes. So I noticed that we collected 77% of our property taxes. Yes. So is that good or bad? At that this is... point in time, how, like how do we know if that's good or bad? Drew, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's on par with where we were last year okay. at this time. So we, we do track fiscal year to fiscal year where we are right. month over month. Okay. Um, if anything comes up as a red flag as we compare month over month, I mean, or months to or year to date, right. I guess it would be a better way to put it. Um, we'll flag that for you and, and report it directly. Yeah, that, that, that was my other question. Like I noticed, as you mentioned, you know, some of the expenses, um, you know, they either occur way after the revenue mm -hmm. or way before the revenue, and so we see it and we're not really sure. So, can we count on you to say, um, d even though this one looks bad, it, it isn't, or this one is really bad, even though it might not look like it is because we're anticipating something, because we don't, we don't see that coming down the road. Right, so I think we could probably adjust, we could adjust the monthly report that you all get to show prior year to date. Yeah, that would be The helpful, percentage, so the yeah. percentage. But also the, the habit that I've always gotten into is if there's something that's looking off compared to budget or just off in general, you're gonna hear about it here, yeah. right? Well, I think that's a good suggestion, yep. though, showing year to date this year, last year. That gives us a feel for, you know, if we're just no on normal trend or whether something's out of yeah, whack. Yeah, absolutely. There. And we were a little bit higher compared to this time last year um, because the tax bills went out late last year. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. No. Okay. And then I just saw a couple of things. I mean, I don't wanna really get in the weeds, but I saw something where there was like, I think it was in police or fire, there was no FICA, then there was FICA this year or something. Um, okay, well, we'll look into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so that was um, during the budget process, um, the council heard me drone on ad nauseum about adding some additional lines to the budget. Um, FICA used to be budgeted completely in the governing body oh, yeah, budget, okay. administration. not in, not so where it's all separate, was. It's got its own line. Okay. So every department where there's payroll now has a FICA liability yeah. show. All right, got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I had a question and I just kind of forgot it, so I will ask you later. Okay. Um, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. So, I think it's, are you up? Yes, I, That's it. I think. And oh, I did, I did have one more question. On the garbage, is, is it tonnage that's driving the cost up? Is it our tonnage is way up on garbage pickup? Wasn't it higher year to date this year versus last year? I'll have year? to go back and look at it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't, I wasn't Maybe triggered. I should have made a special note on where that was or I saw that. I might have read it wrong, but. It I just, wasn't triggered, yeah. it was nothing, nothing alarmed compared to okay. where we were last year. Okay, great, thank you. I, I realize now that we went through items A and B, getting that financial presentation, so thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, item nine, Mayor's agenda. Uh, I'll, I'll step in for um, Mayor Kingston just to give Mayor Pro Tem uh, agenda, but I just obviously wanna hope that everyone had a very nice holiday, and I'm really looking forward to a great 2022. Uh, ahead with um, you know both here in, in this group with uh, with our town as well as uh, out in the uh, in the town itself with all the visitation and all the visitors we have a lot of really um, exciting it challenging things ahead for us this year so I'm looking forward to working with everybody on on those and particularly in the um, doing some planning uh, the the, uh, the agenda item that we have for the mid month even in January getting some uh, getting some projections and planning going as to look ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the, that idea and those meetings and, and a lot of the new ideas that are coming together. So it's, that's, uh, other than that, um, just uh, looking forward to everything we've got ahead. Um, so that's all I have for my agenda. And um, we'll start with Rob, anything for you? No, nothing for me, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, Sandy? Uh, just like to wish everyone a happy new year and a great year coming up. And a little reminder at two o'clock tomorrow, we'd like to see everybody at the south end of Four Seasons to help plant. I'm looking forward to that too. I'm gonna be there. 
How about you, Tony? No, nothing to add. Thank okay, you. great. So. Um, uh, under ad additional other business, um, we have additional public comments. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add to public comment period? Um, I will say that uh, as we mentioned, oh yes, Jim. So thank you, just to repeat what Jim said, um, for all those people that are coming out to help plant tomorrow at two o'clock, uh, rather than go to Four Seasons, the South End, if you go to Plover, there'll be better parking there. So that would be a, a better place to go. Thank you for that reminder. And um, although public comments are not responded to, uh, they are listened to and we will be um, working through some of the comments that we heard this evening in public comments. So thank you very much for, for those comments. Uh, and if we don't have any additional business, um, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you.